Y'all know me. Know how I earn a living. This shark swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks, Chief. I'll find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell, shark. We've got a pile of iron hands on the 4th of July. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck hull of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're gonna need a bigger boat. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? you Get your name into the National Geographic. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. Broadcasting around the world and across the globe, this is the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Welcome back, everyone, to this globally ranked top 3% of all podcasts, according to listennotes.com. The Jaws Obsession. This is episode 55. How exciting is that? 55 episodes in, look how far we have come as a Jaws community and building upon the expanded Jaws universe with 55 episodes in and we are full steam ahead. There is so much more going on in Jaws and we're revealing that on every show and this episode will be no different because what we are going to do today is we are going to talk about the harpoon rifle in Jaws. Who was Arthur Ben David and how did he change the movie Jaws forever? What is the history behind Quint's harpoon rifle, not just in the production of Jaws, but what purpose does it serve to the Jaws universe? There's two different things there. There's so much to go over and to learn on this 55th episode of the Jaws Obsession. I learned a lot in uh, researching this episode, so we're all learning together on this in real time. I'd like to thank you for spending your time in listening to this broadcast. So in this episode, we're going to touch on some emails here. We have some emails, uh, some questions into the Jaws Obsession, also some early reviews from early readers of the Book of Quint. And then we are going to dive into an interview with John Tedder, our orca specialist, regarding the harpoon rifle in Jaws. And then in part three, we're going to step into the Jaws universe and we're going to divide, because that's what we do here on the Jaws Obsession, is what we're painting is there, there are two sets of realities here. So the one, the one reality that we all know is that Jaws, the production of Jaws. But then when you go into the Jaws universe, that's a hyperactive reality is what we call it, is that there is a third island called Amity. Even though it was filmed on Martha's Vineyard, we can't use Martha's Vineyard as Amity because it is stated in Jaws that there is a third island. And that was proven by Jaws, the Jaws Obsession episode 32, Amity Island Geography, where we proved using audio taken from the movie Jaws that Amity is actually a third island. So what we are establishing here is that there's facts of what's going on and the props used in Jaws in real time, in real life back in the summer of 74, while they were filming Jaws. But then you have to look at how is it portrayed in the movie and what are the, how is that presented in the Jaws universe because the Jaws universe is not real life. So that's what we're doing here is we're, we're expanding on that so we can learn more of what's going on inside Jaws and also the characters of Jaws. 
So that's uh, that's all on the docket here. So let's just jump right in. Let's go, let's go right over to the emails here. I had an email from Michael. said, good morning, Ryan. First off, I want to say the book is a forensic masterpiece and has reawakened my love for the movie. I pray to all that's holy that this is taken up by Mr. Spielberg. Bravo to you, sir. My question may have been covered in the podcast or not, but has anyone ever discussed the color of red used on the orca? There had to have been a specific hue that was used. I've always been curious. I'm also in the process of sanding a rowboat uh, bookcase and wanted to either paint it to match the orca or the skiff in the pond. I'd be curious of those colors as well. Uh, anyway, I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you for the amazing work on the book of Quint. Farewell and adieu, Michael in White Plains, New York. Michael, thank you for writing in. I did talk to John regarding the red that's used on the orca. John responded, he said that Edith Blake described it as a blood red when it was finished. Uh, what it really was, was a burgundy color that was later sanded down to make it look sun bleached. In some shots, it looks almost oxide like. So it's not as brilliant of a red as it might look in some of the pre-production photos. But the red is almost, from according to John, it's a, it's a burgundy color that was later sanded down to make it look sun bleached. That's the red used on the orca. I don't know if there was ever an accounting of the type of red they used where they have the number system for what color was used. But if that does come up, I'm sure we could find that out. But that's right from John over at orcarebuild.com. He'll be coming up later in the show with an interview. And also, uh, Michael was talking about the Book of Quint, that he calls it a forensic masterpiece, and it's reawakened his love for the movie, which is great to see because that's what we are trying to do here in the Jaws Obsession and what's uh, the, the entire purpose behind the Book of Quint. As I've said over and over again, is that what we are doing is we are we are elevating Jaws even higher than it is by adding a quality prequel that's building context in order to add subtext to Jaws later on. So that's what's exciting here. And people that are reading the book, readers that like Michael that are reading the book, they're actually seeing that in real time. As, we're, as I'm talking to you right now, there are readers all over the world that are actually seeing the complete picture, which is very exciting. So thank you very much for writing in, Michael. As always, I appreciate the great compliments on the Book of Quint. And if for anyone that wants to know, the Book of Quint is still available over at the Cracked Bean Roastery's website. You can find the details in the description of this broadcast of whatever platform you're listening on. You just go right down to that information. You'll, I always put the, the links down in there. You could also go to, uh, as, as well as on YouTube, the links are there as well. You can find uh, information also if you follow us over at Instagram, at Book of Quint at Instagram, go, or you could go to JawsOB.com. There's all sorts of uh, information on uh, where and how to either get in contact with me, myself. I'm always over at Instagram. You can drop me a message over there. Uh, or you can send me an email at JawsOB2025 at gmail.com. There's less than 20 left, so if anyone is interested in reading the limited edition 300 that were made for the Indiegogo campaign from over the summer, there's still a few left over there. Just go to thecrackedbeanroastery.com slash merch at their merchandise section, and you'll see the Book of Quint just sitting there. If you're in Syracuse, New York, you can walk right in. There's a little display there on the counter. You can just grab the book that way. Let's move on because we have books that have been sent all over the world. And we have readers in many different countries that are working their way through the Book of Quint. It's exciting to get in real time feedback. I had an email from Brent. Brent writes in, So I'm hip deep in things now, chapter 17, the offer, but let me start with thoughts thus far. Firstly, the aesthetic of the book is just beautiful. The lack of dust cover is a classy move, as avid readers quickly discard these. The font is easy to read, and the paperweight being slightly lighter than typical lends it the gravitas usually reserved for academic text. Chapter length is concise, enabling the reader to, di to digest the previous chapter in a natural cadence, almost re reminiscent of a cinematic eye. I suspect that's your background as a director showing itself. The pace of the first chapters, Indianapolis Aftermath, traveled at an addictive rate while not having to compromise itself in any detail. The horrors of the surviving crew were generously outlined whilst not being pornographic. The particulars of the Catalina were well-researched and descriptive enough to paint a picture 
For one, not familiar with the PBY, but didn't distract from the story. I see the research on the sailors in the water as almost historic in reference. Chapter 13, Maureen takes us into the real scars of the man and his descent of self-loathing and fluency with violence. This is such a beautifully written book. I read a lot these days, and this stands out in its tempo and clarity. It would easily support itself outside the canon as a self-standing piece, and I think that's the real test of great writing. The litmus test for me is how I can recall the characters and scenes in my mind's eye after the fact, and this book comes back in cinematic detail. This is a genuinely outstanding piece of literature. Whilst being uncomfortable with the demonization of sharks in general, I, can, I can't dismiss the depth of Quint's self-loathing. That's fascinating, very human, and understandable. Really can't wait to continue reading. That's Brent in New Zealand. Brent, thank you so much. What those are? That's an amazing partial review right there. Brent's calling that uh, the book of Quint, he says, is a genuinely outstanding piece of literature. That is something that I was overwhelmed to hear. And I wrote Brent back to tell him that though know, that means so much to myself. That means so much to all the work that was put into this, as we've detailed on the Jaws Obsession. He also says he echoes the review that uh, Marty Milner, the construction foreman on Jaws, gave over during episode 50 of the Book of Quint. Uh, Brent says that it would easily support itself outside the canon as a self-standing piece. And I think that's the real test of great writing. That's what uh, Brent said. And that's just what Marty Milner said, is that you don't need to read Jaws, the book. You don't even need to watch Jaws. That this book stands on its own. And that is one of those things that I really focused on, that I wanted to have a standalone story but at the same time, would that help bolster the movie Jaws as you watch it in succession? And I actually, I've talked to some uh, people that are that haven't seen Jaws or haven't seen Jaws in decades, and they're reading the book. So I'm excited to see their reviews of when after they watch Jaws, after they read the book of Quint, what do they notice? What How do they see Jaws in that light? But wow, what an amazing review by Brent in New Zealand. Yeah, that was uh that that's that was quite the partial review right there, and that's what I really I really like that. There's um there's readers that are sending me messages on Instagram even when they just finish a chapter uh, recently, like a chapter eleven, and they just shoot me a comment, and we we have a little back and forth. It's always nice to see what people are thinking, or and it's exciting for me. I described it as the director in the back of the theater watching the audience's reaction to the film that's playing and um, the director knows what's coming up and he it, it's the anticipation of what that audience is going to react to. And that's what I like is when I know what they just read, but I also know what is they're about to they are about to read. And that's exciting for me as well. Also what I like about these partial reviews is that I I'm taking the input and I'm using that to uh, solidify in myself what works, what doesn't work, um, uh, were my theories correct in how you build the narrative and how you structure the chapters and the information that's given throughout the book. There's a lot more that went into the book of Quint than just uh, writing out the story. There, the, the presentation was first and foremost. And I like how uh, many of the comments talk about the aesthetic, the feel of the book in your hands. I believe that's all part of the experience, is that as you're reading, uh, uh, what you're holding is almost as important as what you're reading inside. It's the whole experience of it all. And thank you so much, Brent, for writing in. I look forward to his full review. So exciting. So exciting. This is great stuff. So that was from New Zealand. So that's from the other side. So look at how we're, we're, we're just bouncing around the world here. So we're going to come back to the United States. Here's a review from, uh, here is a full review from Connecticut over in the, on the East Coast here in the USA. Ryan, I finished reading the book of Quinn a while ago, but wanted to give it time to really settle in before I responded. First of all, the book itself looks amazing. I love the cloth cover and the graphic. It just feels right when you are holding it. I can say without a doubt that the first part of the book was my favorite. Not to say I didn't enjoy the whole thing. The way that you wrote what life, if you could call it that, was like on the water for the survivors was chilling. 
The attention to detail made me feel like I was in the water with them, suffering and in constant fear. I think that you did an amazing job of capturing what this horrific existence would have been like. We can all appreciate why Quint is Quint from experiencing this event with him. I would be shocked if any of the survivors of this and other ship sinkings don't have horrible nightmares that they wake up screaming every night. Now, that's very important. I'll stop right there. That What he said, he said, we can all appreciate why Quint is Quint from experiencing this event with him. And that is, that's, a, that's a very profound observation right there is because I uh, was watching how, the, how Jaws was moving through my life and how it was being received by future generations. And Quint was almost becoming a caricature, a cartoon character, um, the crazy guy on a boat. What my goal was with the book of Quint was to give him more history and thus, uh, you would understand and appreciate why Quint is the way he is. And that's going forward is the more you know about the past, the better you will understand the, the, the character in Jaws. Is it possible for us to be sympathetic with the main character who it's as we know today about sharks and shark hunting? Is it possible to understand how he got to that point? when we meet Quint in July of 1974. And that's what we're looking at here in this review. So let me continue on here. This is, uh, this is from Brandon in Connecticut. Let me continue on here. He writes, The other aspect of this book that really spoke to me was how you were able to create a living, breathing character of the orca, giving the ship an origin story and all of the detail that went into them resurrecting this ship from the graveyard to a fully functional vessel was just fascinating. I could really see all of the details in my mind's eye. This attention to detail is really what sets this book apart from just a regular novel. The Book of Quint is the perfect companion piece to the movie with so many tie-ins and Easter eggs that feed right into the movie and help us understand why things are the way they are in the movie. It certainly enhances my experience of watching Jaws. There is no doubt that this was a labor of love, and you can really see and feel the blood, sweat, and tears that went into the making of this novel. I hope you are proud for what you have created and the gift that you have given us Jaws fans. Uh, there was a great interview with Steven Spielberg on the Smartless podcast recently that makes me feel like he still has many more movies left in him, so who knows? Thank you for your continued efforts on the podcast. Sincerely, Brandon in Connecticut. Thank you, Brandon. Wow, thank you so much. That's great. That's a... Uh, that's great that it's, he says it's the perfect companion piece for the movie. Many tie-ins. He saw the many tie-ins, the Easter eggs that, fe uh, that feed right into the movie, and it enhances his experience of watching Jaws. Isn't that the end game here? Isn't that what we're all trying to do, what we're all hope for, is that uh, to see our the greatest movie of all time, Jaws, taken care of as it's ushered into another 50 years of existence because we have the 50th anniversary coming up on 2025. And isn't this nice to see that that's just with the book, we are already there. We have a novel that takes care of the film. Very, very exciting to see. And thank you so much, Brandon, for supporting the novel and as well as this great review. Uh, it's just wonderful. He also talked about the living, breathing character of the orca. Uh, not to give too many spoilers away. Th that's what I always saw the orca as it draws you in. And I'm seeing that even in some of the in, in fans, not to mention just John Tedder, who's rebuilding a full scale orca. But many, many fans out there have models. They get into model building of the orca. We had Noel Constantino on the show. He makes a, a model orcas as well. So what happens is, is that this movie Jaws has this aura around it. And the orca certainly has a personality and an aura around it as well. And I believe that that's inside the Jaws universe, that that is felt as you approach the vessel. So a a as, you get, as you go on board the vessel, you feel that presence. And I would be so curious to see if there would be a director that would tackle the Book of Quint, that if they were to portray this on film, how would you portray the orca? aura of the orca because that's very important to what we have going forward that this 
vessel attracts has an attraction to it, it, it and it pulls you in it almost consumes you and that's what's a, it's it's really interesting and that's it's an interesting side point that that is just mentioned in the book of quint but i think there's a lot more there that can be explored and uh we that's much more to get into later on but thank you so much brandon for the email and the full review of the book of quint i look forward to talking to you more on that later. Now let's go across the Atlantic. Let's go over to the UK. We have, uh, here's an email from Hayden. Hayden writes in, hi Ryan, starting chapter 12 tonight so far. Love the pace, description, detail, and how the book holds you in each scenario Quint and his shipmates find themselves. The tension throughout the backstories, adding familiarization to the characters makes for gripping reading as the oceanic white tips gather around the survivors of the sinking. An emotional ride in many ways, the tension hits a new high with the arrival of the PBY. The last few pages of chapter 11, wow. You know Quint survives, but hey, you start to doubt what you know can't yet be. I feel even at this early stage of the book, we'll go to some explaining in what we see later in what makes Quint tick. Nice work in leading us to the when and why regarding Quint's character in Jaws. I know now that this will be one of those books you don't want to end. The book feels good in one's hand also. Quality. Funny enough, I was I watched an incredibly young mayor of Jaws on an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. By chance, tonight, while scrolling through the channels, the planets are aligning. All the best, Ryan. Hayden from Bournemouth, UK. Thank you so much. Hayden is the is um is mentioning uh, Hayden is helping me out working the uh, channels over in the UK regarding the book of Quint. Is it possible we could get publication out of the UK for this novel? That's all the, all the avenues are open. We're, we're leaving no stone unturned. I told Hayden that he is the official Jaws Obsession UK wing, the, the UK wing of the Jaws Obsession. And he's working his way through the book. Absolutely has great comments there. And that first part of the book seems to be wrapping people right up, talking about the tension and all that through through the chapters. And remember, that first part of the book of Quint details the last day in the water. So that would be August 2nd, uh, 1945, for the survivors. There is so much that went on in the sinking, not just the buildup, with the Indianapolis and the its secret mission. But then there was the sinking. And then there's the survival after the sinking. And then there is what happens after they all get back. If you were able to survive, now you have to survive the rest of your life with the memories of surviving. So there is there is so much that has happened with that Indianapolis that um I I felt that to focus on just that last day, there is so much that happened that that's enough to get the point across of just what these men went through. And it's great to see. And everything that's in that first part has some sort of basis in reality. I don't want to say any spoilers. We're not going to get into any specifics, but I really didn't have to make much up in terms of the scary aspects of what happened, what what the sharks were doing, how the sharks were hunting and tracking them, how the men were reacting to the sharks, um, the conditions in the water. I just had to just put myself, I used all the research I did to put myself into the water and then, and then begin the writing process. And that's coming out as people are reading it and they're, they're latching right onto that, which is, which is, which is great to see. It's great to see when a plan comes together like that. So thank you very much, Hayden, for writing in. Great reviews. Thank you very much. Keep them coming. JawsOB2025 at gmail.com. Always interested to know what you are thinking about the Book of Quint. Okay, so we're all here to talk about the harpoon rifle, Quint's harpoon rifle used in the movie Jaws. So in order to draw a complete profile of Quint's harpoon rifle, the details and the history surrounding the rifle, we will now turn to the technical advisor to the Book of Quint and the Jaws Obsession's very own orca specialist, Mr. John Tedder. Great to have you back on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. So, John, have you recovered from the holiday history? Hit over at Quint Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com. How was the season over there? Uh, it was busy. <laughs> I got more orders than I really expected to. Excellent. But, um, Excellent. So Jaws is as popular as ever, right? Oh, as ever. Absolutely. That's great. Great to hear. Great to hear. And thank you for coming back on the show. It's been a while. We have to get you on the show more often. 
because um, <laughs> we're, we have to bring out the, this this one. This was a special episode for episode fifty five. I wanted to do a deep dive into Quint's harpoon rifle. Let's just jump right in with a spec sheet or a fact sheet of the Greener rifle. This is the rifle that Quint uses as a harpoon rifle in the movie Jaws. What's the weight when fully assembled? Uh, when it's fully assembled, it's right at eight pounds. The Inside the box, it weighs almost 30 because it, the box is really sturdy. Okay. So the green case that he's that he takes out, and he throws onto the table as he's assembled. That's a 30 pounds altogether. That's 30 pounds. Correct. With the ammunition, the oil, the rods, the cleaning rods, the harpoon darts, okay. line wraps, everything. Wow. Okay. And then so it's eight pound rifle. What's the length of that rifle when fully assembled? Right at 36, 36 and a half inches. 36 and a half inches. Okay. So just over three feet. And what kind of wood is used in the stock and hand grip there? It's oak that has been sanded down to, so you can see the fine grain pattern on it, and then it's been stained, and then it has a nice coating on it of lacquer that's been sanded down so it's real smooth. Okay. And the reason it's oak is because oak resists weather pretty well, and it holds up. Gun manufacturers have been using oak for a very long time. Okay, all right. The ammunition that the rifle uses, what type of ammunition? The one used in the movie uses a thirty-eight special blank cartridge that is crimped on the end and sealed with wax what was the is there a british 303 is that what is that the british 303 ammunition so the british 303 ammunition the rifle was first invented on a rolling block action in the 1930s and for anyone that doesn't know what a rolling block action is if you google the movie quigley down under that sharps rifle that he uses that's a rolling block action. All the harpoon gun is is a tooled down version of a rifle that would have used a 303 British round with a Martini Henry action on it. So for the handguard, you push it down, it ejects the shell, you put in a new one, and you push it back up, and you're locked and ready to go. So it's a single shot rifle. Single shot. But the yep. original. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the original 303 British for the rolling block action is what it was initially that was the first concept of it in my reading though some a lot of, a lot of times it's referenced as a 45 caliber shell right so it's like uh it says a 45 caliber blank shell is that i'm going to be reading something later on is that a little inaccurate or is that kind of what the uh the what'd you say was a 38 special round it's a 38 special blank so the 45 so throughout the years they went down okay for economical reasons. So it originally originally started out as a 303 British on the rolling block action. Mm -hmm. And then there's a picture that we'll include on the show notes. Okay. In uh, 1938 of Leighton Greener, who owned the Greener, WW Greener Company in England. Uh, he's holding the later version of the harpoon gun, and it's no longer on a rolling block action. It is now on the Martini Henry action, but it's not quite to the point to where it was in Jaws yet. And it would have used the 45 cartridge for it because this is around the time of right before World War II. 45 cartridges were very popular. Right. And they changed it. So it's a smaller round than a 303 British cartridge. The 45 is smaller, and you still get about the same amount as punch through as what the 303 does. Okay. Yeah. That was one of my questions is does that affect the accuracy or the, you know, the distance of the harpoon? As you went, as they step down in rounds, size of well, rounds. Well, of course, anytime. Well, of course, anytime you step down in a caliber of round, of course it's going. It's going. Your your total effectiveness at distance with a 303 British is going to be much further than a 38 or a 45. Aha. Of course. Okay. All right. Good. Because well, in the book of Quint, we I remember we uh, we plugged in with the 303 uh, British. Mm -hmm. That's because that's how he finds it. So, uh, right. that, and I, that's why I want everyone to realize that there were multiple cartridges used in multiple different calibers with this rifle. We've already talked about the year of manufacture that they started uh, experimenting with harpoon rifles over at the Greener Company. Do we have any history on William Greener and the Greener rifle manufacturer, like a, maybe a brief history? We do. In fact, the WW Greener with William Greener was first created in 1829, and he started out very simple. He was a second-generation family gunsmith. 
and he started his own company in 1829 in England, Birmingham, England, and that's where they're still at today. However, they no longer make harpoon guns. They stick with mostly double rifles, and okay. uh, they make a few shotguns. They, they stick with mostly uh, sporting type things for land. I think that's fascinating that it was from the 1800s this company was making rifles, and this is an, it's a British company. Of course, Robert Shaw, as we know, is a British actor. I just think that's great that Jaws has these British influences coming in uh, from all areas, including the props, as that we're, what we're talking about is the rifle here. What I noticed was, let's see here, I had something here where Greener also improved the harpoon gun and his model was the one adopted by Scottish fisheries and is still in use today. His greatest innovation was the invention of the expanding rifle bullet. So is that kind of accurate, John, that like the Scottish fishing industry, the Scottish fisheries would have been using this first or what years can we verify this rifle was used in sport fishing? Probably around the early 1900s? Correct. And as far as the whole Scottish thing goes, something that people have to realize too is whaling was still very much going on at this time. And it was used for whaling, but Greener, they had a larger version of a harpoon gun, but it was deck mounted. And this was their answer for going out on one of the smaller boats instead of using a handheld harpoon. It was their answer to being able to fire it. You had more of a chance of making it with a rifle than you did of actually throwing one like, you know, like Queequeg would and Moby Dick or yeah. Ahab would, you know, something like that. Okay. So the Scottish, they were using it for both fishing and whaling and people in the Americas were also using it for whaling at the time because whaling was still a very big industry. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And this was back in, yeah, in the, in the twenties and all that. Um, how, mm-hmm. ac- how accurate is the harpoon and what ranges was it designed for? Like what distances? With the 303 British, it would have been accurate up to probably 80 meters about. Now with the one that's used in the movie, which is a 38 special blank cartridge, mm-hmm. it would have been accurate up to 30 meters and hold an 8-inch group. For somebody that doesn't know, when you hear an 8-inch group, somebody says, well, that's a fairly big group that's not very tight, but you also got to realize you're shooting a harpoon dart that's going to take up a majority of that 8 inches, so that that's mm-hmm. really close together. So you're saying the grouping would be in that 8-inch range or the 8-inch diameter? Correct. What would you say, 20, 20, 30 meters? Up to 30 meters. 30 meters. So the quint caliber mm-hmm. in Jaws is up to 30 meters. One little thing that you don't really see, it's kind of hard to find on the Internet now, somewhere... I've got it on VHS, and I'm about to date myself here. But back in the 80s, there was a television program that came on and was real later shown in the 90s. And it was a special on the Forestry Department of the United States. They were using a version of the Greener Harpoon Dart with a, a Greener Harpoon Rifle made for the service, the forest industry, and mm-hmm. the dart on the end had been rounded off. And what it was is so that it was, they were used in California in the Redwoods so they could shoot them up into the trees and tie off lines so they could climb the trees oh, at the time. And, mm-hmm. wow. and I don't know if that video is even around anymore. I have it on VHS here somewhere. It may even be on YouTube. So you're saying there's mul- there was multiple uses. There were multiple uses for the greener rifle to actually fire off a projectile with a rope attached mm-hmm. to it. See, right, and even yeah. during the maritime with the merchant marines and everything like that, they would use the rifle to shoot over like mailbags, like yeah. small mailbags to the crews from ship to ship. They ah. do that. Okay, so almost like a, what a heaving line would do. Okay, so you just fire Basically, it off. Yes. Yeah, but you can get them off. You don't have to be that close. That's that's amazing. That's a pretty that's pretty interesting right there. You've obviously fired this rifle quite a few times. Okay. Does it pack a kick? How is it firing the harpoon? Is it like because in the in the movie Jaws, Quince he fires it from the hip, he fires it from the shoulder. Uh, is it is it one of those ones that packs a, a kick and damages your shoulder, or is it something that's actually accessible? The best way I know how to describe it, it kicks about like a thirty thirty repeating rifle. So it's got a good little kick to it. The uh, it is a blank cartridge, so it doesn't shoot anything out the end of it except for percussion. Okay. That's all it is, is basically like a think of a Revolutionary War percussion rifle because you have to load in your ball, which is loading on harpoon dart and powder blast. The force from that is blowing the 
ball off. So in this case, it's blowing the harpoon dart off. So all it is is a modern day con- concussion rifle. Wow, that's great. I don't think I've ever even realized that. That's awesome, John. That's awesome. So in a practical sense, let's talk about a practical sense, real world application. What would you use if you're in for large game fish? What use would a rifle fired harpoon have? Because let's say we're not dealing with barrels. That's that's the Jaws universe. So let's just say you have the greener harpoon rifle. What would and it's 1935 or 1940. And what is the practical application of this rifle? Okay, very good question. So, as in a big game fishing sense, it would have been used for sharks. I mean, that was greeners. That was one of their target industries. For it was for sharks, but also for whaling not giant sperm whales and things like that but smaller whales younger okay. whales yep and then tuna swordfish marlin but your big game fish now as far as how would how would it be used in a practical sense would obviously you shoot the fish but instead of using um, a barrel you know like quint did they would have some sort of floating device that way number one they could see where the fish goes and also yep. where they can track it and then how they can also recover it because anything that's floating on top of the water, the fish can't pull down. It's don't tire them out and it's just don't weaken them. And the harpoon dart on the front, it's not a fixed blade. When it goes in, the side barbs come out and it keeps it from pulling out. So it ain't going nowhere. That the harpoon right. darts will stay in there. So is this more, could it be also used for the, the recovery? So let's say you get the, the you get the tuna on your rod and reel. Mm-hmm. You get it close to your vessel. Would you, would they, would the old timers have had the dart, they fire the dart into the fish on the side and then they don't, they don't have to worry about trying to land it with a landing hook. You just kind of wait for the fish to tire out and then you just go retrieve it because it's on a line at that point, right? Yeah, you, I could see them doing that and that would, that would be it. You'd be able to do that. So that it's like it's, it's like tethered the fish instead of reaching over and trying to gaff it and, and you know heaving it up with all the weight. You would just kind of throw the dart into it. You fire the dart into it. And now you have it tethered. Right. Yeah. And you just pull it in. Okay. Yeah. See, I was just thinking like that's just it. Just seems like it was. What would it have taken the place of? What would it have made easier if you didn't have the greener harpoon rifle? Like you'd have to manually try to huff, huff that over the side. Now at least you can actually have a line on it, and it can be sort of under the water because you can actually fire that into the water, right? Like a surface a little bit. Yes, you can. Yeah. So okay, well this is see, so okay so we're we're, we're establishing the uh, the history of the greener rifle in the practical sense of it. There's one thing that is in Quint's case when he opens it up, and we're going to show pictures of that. You're going to supply some pictures of the uh, components of the greener harpoon rifle in your case. But if you look at in Quint's case, there's a there's a bridge attachment and a nylon line that came with the greener rifle. It's seen in the movie, but it's not used in the movie. And what is it, what actually is the purpose of that right there? If you could explain really quick. So, what that's for is you attach it to the end of the rifle, and that's what you wrap your line on. That goes to the harpoon dart, and obviously you have to have enough line coming off of the bracket itself, going to whatever you don't use as a flotation device. But right. all that was was to keep the line out of the way from being stepped on, and that's really all it was for to keep it out of the way from getting snagged on something, but you can use it whether it's got that on the front or not, as we saw in the movie, it, it's going to work out of the way. Yeah. It's only there to basically tidy things up. Right. Okay. So it pays the line out going forward. Right. So it's not hanging all out down to the water's edge. Correct. Okay. Well, that's interesting. That's that's just some of the components that we see in Jaws, but Quint's obviously not using that, that, that component right there, even though he must've uh, thought of it before because he has it on, on scene there. Let's just talk about bringing the greener rifle into Jaws now. Okay. So it finds its way into Jaws. We, we both know that Peter Benchley wrote in Jaws, he wrote of Quint throwing harpoons, manually throwing harpoons that were affixed to a line that were affixed to red wooden barrels in the book. Um, mm-hmm. And so it, this that technique actually stayed in the first draft treatment that came to Universal from Peter Benchley. The greener rifle was something that came up on the set of Jaws. It was not planned during the screenwriting phase. Now I have something I'm going to read here and you're going to supply us with a lot of context from here. So, so this is from page 263 of Jaws Memories from Martha's Vineyard by Matt Taylor. There's a little side note here to the greener rifle. 
Um, this is a quote from Arthur Ben David. He says, Bob Maddy came to me one day wanting to know the most realistic way of harpooning a shark. I told him that when I was a kid, we used sticks, but the new way to do it was with a harpoon gun. I happened to have one, so I took him over to my boat to show him, and he really lit up when he saw it. I told him he could borrow it for the summer if he needed to. He said, great, I think this is going to work. Then I showed him how to put it together. It's a greener harpoon gun made in the 60s in Birmingham, England. A 45 caliber blank shell blows the dart straight off the end of the gun and takes the line attached to the keg with it. Bob took the gun, and that was the last time I saw it until they were through shooting. He thanked me very much, but never said anything about whether they had actually used it or not. Sure as heck, when we went to see the movie the next summer, there it was all over the place. That's a quote from Arthur Ben David from the book Jaws Memories from Martha's Vineyard by Matt Taylor. John, let's talk about who was Bob Maddy in relation to the Jaws set. So Bob Maddy was a special effects artist, and he was hired to create the sharks for Jaws because he had actually worked for the Walt Disney Company, and he had made the giant squid for 20,000 leagues under the sea. So Universal had hired him to create the malfunctioning shark that is so famous. Right. So he, he was the he was the architect behind that, the cradle that the shark is on that's able to make mm -hmm. it, and, and all the articulation and all that. So he is now on set, and he's kind of talking to Arthur Ben David. Who was Arthur Ben David in relation to the Jaws set? So Arthur Ben David was the harbor master at the time, and he also owned a car lot, Ben David Auto. They use his car lot to put a lot of the stuff together and park vehicles. And since he was the harbor master, he knew about everything going on because they'd have to get permission from him mm -hmm. to go all of these all the, all these different places in the water. And so that's how Arthur Ben David come about. And he is responsible for the harpoon gun making. Right, he's Jaws what it is today. He's the re he's responsible for that. So everybody has to realize that. If it wasn't for Arthur Ben David, there would have been no harpoon gun in the, in the movie Jaws. It would have been Quint throwing harpoons. And Bob Maddy had the wherewithal to actually go talking around to people. And he was looking around for, he came to me one day wanting to know the most realistic way of harpooning a shark. So there must have been some discussion saying, it's it's going to be kind of hard throwing harpoons like Peter Benchley wrote and like it is in the screenplay, and then this mm -hmm. this rifle the the idea of the rifle came about and that was that that so this rifle that was that was owned by Arthur Ben David was the principal architect that was the, this was this was like the the model that was used so Bob Maddy took this and obviously showed it to Steven Spielberg okay he obviously showed it to um, the, the producers and even uh, Joe Elves. And so mm -hmm. this, was the, this was the rifle that started it all. Now, how many rifle, greener rifles were used on set? Do we have that knowledge? Yes, there were three that were ordered from the Navy Arms Company, which was the U.S. distributor of greener firearms in the United States. Oh, wow. Okay. So there was one distributor, and they ordered, mm -hmm. they ordered three. They ordered three. So three plus the Arthur Ben David one makes four. So they had four. Four, correct. four right. The greener rifle that you are in possession right now as you're sitting here talking to me, mm -hmm. that is the Arthur Ben David rifle, right? The the one that correct. inspired the use of that of the of, of the other three on set in Jaws, correct? Correct. Could you explain the lineage of that rifle and how you were able to come in possession with it? Arthur, Mr. Ben David, he had bought the rifle, and he had it during the time when Jaws was filmed, and then he had it up until his death, and at that point, his son, Rennie Ben David, it was left to him, and Rennie actually makes an appearance in the movie. He was one of the uh, locals that was hired. Mm -hmm. He was on the sailboat with Michael when it gets tipped over in the estuary pond. So he's one of the other two boys, right? Because right, right, there was three of them, right? It was Michael, and there was two other boys on that sailboat? Yeah. Yes. Rennie was the one to the far left, and he says, come on, hurry up, get that done. Hurry up, get that done. You can't do a damn thing until we get, get this undone. Get that untangle up there. I'm doing it! Right, okay, so he's the first kid there, right there, okay. Mm -hmm. And I had, I, I've had the memories from Martha's book 
for a while, and I'm friends with a few people on the island, and one of them, I saw he had posted a picture with a Grinner harpoon rifle, and sure enough, it's the one that you see in the book, and it was Rennie, so I just, I called Mikey one day, and I asked him, I said, uh, Mikey, I have a question. He said, well, I have an answer. Would Rennie Ben David maybe be open to selling the Grinner harpoon gun? And he goes, I don't know. I can ask him. So he put me in touch with Rennie, and wow. the the rest is history. And, of course, during this time, there's uh, quite a few things going on in my life, and I was not able to go get it right away like I wanted to, so I had to wait a few months. But right. come October of 2021, after the summer was over, I took me a two-week trip to Martha's Vineyard, hung out, and interviewed Rennie for uh, my YouTube channel and bought the harpoon gun from him, and he sits in my gun safe whenever I'm not looking at it or admiring it. What a fantastic lineage is that Rennie actually saw this rifle was passed down from his father to him. And he knows that it needs the lineage of this rifle is very important. And he recognized that with you, with the orca rebuild.com, your orca rebuild project and how you have a passion for jaws and that you, you went over there, that interview that you did with him and everybody, if you go to John's YouTube channel, Orca Rebuild over at YouTube. We're going to put links in the show notes and also in the description of this broadcast. Watch that interview that John has with Rennie Ben David, where he talks about his dad. He talks about the rifle. Um, it's a it's an amazing passing of the torch moment because that rifle has now moved into John's world. It's being taken care of and it's going to be taken care of really well when the when there it's going to be reunited with the orca in the future what does it feel like what did it feel like to take possession there's a very touching moment in that video what did it feel like to take possession of a valued piece of jaws history like that the the arthur ben david greener harpoon rifle that inspired the use of the rifle in the movie jaws well in the in the moment it was a it was a world one of the things it was it, it dawned on me I already knew what I was getting into about how important this rifle is, not only to the film, but how important it was to Mr. Ben David and Rennie. And so I knew what I was getting into, but that moment really, really the, it's kind of hard to put in the words, but it didn't really hit me until after Rennie and I were done with the interview. And you see this in the film because I kept the, I didn't cut the camera off. It was, I don't know why I didn't. I just didn't. It didn't. It didn't dawn on me. And you see me and Rennie shake hands, and he tells me, he "said you take care of it." Right. And I told him, "I said, Rennie, I promise you, I will." So that's when everything really hit me because of the weight of the responsibility of taking care of this rifle, the 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 weight of carrying, like you said, the lineage of this rifle. It, it's a lot because you're not only you're not getting just a rifle. You're not getting just the story with it you're getting the memories that come with it and the love of that rifle that it had right the and all the energies that are put into that rifle exactly right and that, that's and, and that's the thing is that that i i find that fascinating like we talked about there's um there's three other ones and it's hard to find out which ones were screen the ones that were screen used in what scenes because the rifles all look similar. We've talked about that before about this you know that, that some people say was well, is, is it screen used is it not screen used? But the one thing that we can verify is that yours was the first one the Arthur Ben David Greener harpoon rifle that was the one that Bob Maddie would have taken to Spielberg. And that's Correct. the one that would have inspired them to say, go, order three of these. We need this for Robert Shaw. We need this for Quint to show in the movie. And that changed the course of Jaws because Jaws would not be, we talked about the, the amazing thing about Jaws is that it just was making itself. While it, while it was being made, it was molding itself into the movie that we know and love. And that rifle that you have in possession is the part of that that actually became it influenced what Quint is to all of us and even it, to mm -hmm. all of us. It's just, it influenced everything. If it wasn't for Arthur Ben David and having that conversation with Bob Maddie, the, the movie would have been completely different. It would have been, it, it, it's just un amazing to see how things work out like that. And it's, it's real special. Okay. So who else can be verified in having of the other three sets? So we know there's four. Do we know who has the other three? 
Uh, yes, we we do. His name is Chris Kiska, and he is he owns the largest Jaws prop collection. And I'm actually very privileged to be friends with Chris. I've known him for a while, and he owns the other three. Uh, one of them is very unique in the sense that it is bent. <laughs> the rifle is bent. <laughs> So the bent one, yeah, the infamous bent one. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so right before the shark pulls the orca backwards, Quint drops the rifle and he says, untie us, he'll pull out the transom. Untie us! He'll pull out the transom! And Quint drops the rifle. He dropped it to the deck. It actually bent the gun. Wow. So that was where he actually bent the rifle that he was using there. So that's one of Chris's greeners actually has still has that bend in it. Correct, because it's not just he dropped it one time and it bent. It was dropping it multiple times. <laughs> For multiple takes. Wow, that's very unique. So we know that these rifles are in good possession now, and they're being taken care of, and they're out, they're out there. So that, that's what's interesting is even though the Orca is not with us anymore, that the, that there that these rifles that and, and the ones that were used on set, including yours, that was inspired, that these were all these four were in possession of the Jaws production, and then they came back, and now they are with collectors, you and Chris. Correct. Well, there you go. Well, this was everything I wanted it to be here, John. This is awesome. I think we learned a lot. What do you think? I have to agree. And there's one other thing I want to point out, and I'm not trying to blow my own horn or anything, but over the years, Mr. Ben David had been approached by multiple people to sell his rifle, and he had declined. Uh, there was one person, we're not going to put any names out on the air, but one person had went to him, and there was a big thing about it, and tried to buy it off of him, and this guy is a fairly well-known person in the Jaws community, and he tried to buy it from Mr. Ben David, and he said no. So one of the conversations that Rennie and I had was about how many people had tried to come over the years and buy this rifle, and he said that his father said that he wasn't ever going to sell it until the fit felt right. Not going to sell it till it felt right that he found the right person to pass it along to. Yes. And then he saw that in you. Yep. See, that's amazing. Which that's amazing. No way. <laughs> right, right. That's, it would. It, how, how could it not? How could it not? That... That's, and that's the energy that we're talking here is that Jaws means so much to the people that were involved with the production. And that's what we're trying to harness here with the Jaws obsession is to show, and that was it even led into why, you know, John was the technical advisor on the Book of Quint, how much time and care we took into establishing the history of the greener rifle and how it's used mm -hmm. even in the prequel to Jaws. Because that there is that that's what we're doing here, and that's what was so amazing is that when what that's what John brought to the Book of Quint was the his history with the Greener Rifle. That's wonderful, wonderful. So John, thank you so much once again for episode fifty five coming on board here and actually showing us and teaching us more about Jaws history. I appreciate it. Appreciate it so much. How's everything going with the Orca Rebuild Project? It's going good. Now that the Christmas season is over with and I actually have time to sit down and scratch my head, uh, I can get back to going full swing and now I actually have time to edit the rest of uh, my videos together and get the rest of season two out because a lot of people are starting to think that I abandoned the project, but I haven't. It's just that it's the, it's not, the, Roy Schotter said it the best, it's not the time that it takes to take the shot, it's the time it takes to take to take the shot right you know so i do have things that take away time from the boat unfortunately i do oh that's it it's that's, but, that's the world we live in right here yeah that's definitely that's but, you know but that, i think people are understanding that so you're in the middle of season two still like you have that filmed but you just need to edit correct. and post right correct because a lot of people don't realize when you watch let's say one season of my videos you're looking at a year of work because it's not a case of i do one thing for a week, mm -hmm. get it all filmed and edited together. This is several weeks of things. Yeah. And you just don't see that. Yeah. You don't see everything goes into it. Because if I sit there and I film literally everything every day, you're going to be bored out of your mind. You're, when you're sanding, like, I mean, who wants to sit there and watch somebody sand for two hours? Right. Like, seriously. <laughs> you know, it's a very tedious process. And to the people that actually do YouTube for a living full time, uh -huh. uh, my hat is off to those people. I've always said that. Oh, yeah. But it's coming along. She's coming along very well. And 
when season three makes its drop, which I'm going to try to make happen as soon as possible. There's going to be a lot that has been done to the boat that I think really won't surprise a lot of people about what's all been done to her. Okay. I just need people to be a little bit patient with me so I can actually get all this edited together because we're talking about 60 and 70 hours of footage going into wow. it. Maybe, you know, maybe two or three videos. Yeah. So, I mean, and then you got more on top of that. And then it's just, a, it, it's very tedious. We're going to have to hire you a staff. Yeah, I need a staff. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking your time out and coming on the Jaws Obsession. This is awesome. As always, anytime. All right, John. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you later. You're welcome. As always, John impresses me every time he comes on the show. I learned so much from him and his extensive knowledge into Jaws history. And he has been so gracious to give us, the Jaws Obsession, some photo history of the Greener Harpoon Rifle as well as some photos of Arthur Ben David when he had the rifle. And I will be putting them on our show notes over at the Telegram channel at Jaws OB, as well as a few that will go into on Instagram with this with the with the title card of this episode when I announce this episode over on at our Instagram page at Book of Quint. Great interview. Now what I wanted to do was I wanted to transition over into this third part, the final part of this episode, episode 55, was now we are going to step into the Jaws universe. And what we have to figure out is what purpose does the greener rifle serve to the Quint character? in the movie Jaws. After some digesting of the facts and going over uh, a lot of this, what the greener rifle actually brings to the character of Quint is professionalism and progression. And so I want to tackle those uh, those two terms and how it pertains and how the rifle brings that into the Quint equation. Because this is all the these are all the little things that I took into consideration while writing the book of Quint, as I will explain a little bit later. So the first part is professionalism. At the beginning of the film, at the beginning of the film, as we know, with the, the director Spielberg ha- had a um, shows the shark hunting armada of chaos. And in that he filmed a lot of B-roll, uh, which are outtakes. It was just on the spot, they were thinking of things to film that showed the nonsense and the chaos of the situation that was Jaws, that was when the bounty goes down for the shark, the $3,000 bounty. All these fishermen or people that consider themselves fishermen all come out and uh, have their own techniques for hunting and killing the shark. So in that armada of chaos, we see uh, people holding rifles. We see they have spears, harpoons, bow and arrows, they, uh, dynamite sticks. So you see all this just nonsense going on. And even as the tiger shark is strung up, you see uh, quite a few people, even one of our three fishermen that we covered back in the A uh, What episode 53 in the A uh, What episode. The three fishermen, one of them is holding a double barrel shotgun there. And then you see many uh, fishermen in the background and one on the side holding a rifle. So they all have different sets of spears. Some have spears, harpoons, and some obviously fishing rods. So then you have Quint sailing the orca, and he's watching this scene unfold. He's laughing. He tips his hat up, and he's laughing to himself. So what happens is later on in the movie, when the shark, when our three heroes discover the shark, when the rifle is revealed, when the greener harpoon rifle is revealed in the movie Jaws, when he takes out the green case, he opens it up, he's assembling it in the cabin of the orca. What that shows is there's a couple of things that happens there. It shows that Quint is not panicked. By assembling the rifle, he's steady and calculated. So it shows that he's done this before, even though this is the biggest great white anyone has ever seen. He's done this before, and he has something that we have not seen any of the other fishermen use. This new technique, this harpoon rifle that has a barrel hunting technique. So it shows that with just this rifle Without having to state anything in the script, without any dialogue, the audience is, it's communicated to the audience that Quint is thinking outside of the box. He is outside of the general population. He is outside the, the, the masses that we saw how they would have hunted a shark earlier in the movie. Now we have a pro, and this is how a pro is doing it, a professional shark hunter, which is unheard of. And but not in the Jaws universe. So what we're what that's what the greener rifle does is that that in, instantly 
launches Quint into professional status in our eyes. That because at that moment now we are going into the, we are in the action adventure phase of Jaws, which we detailed in the last episode how uh, Jaws transcends and jumps genre boundaries. That was in episode fifty four. So we are in the action adventure stage when the greener. Harpoon, harpoon rifle is revealed, especially it's also when he comes out of the cabin. When he comes out of the cabin, Martin Brody is trying to work his way aft on the orca and he sees the harpoon spear, the, the spear tip, and his eyes get really wide and he immediately goes the other, the other direction. It plays a, uh, it reveal, it almost plays an Indiana Jones type of music. So, so if we if you watch this scene, that's all that that rifle. What that rifle does is is that launches uh, that that puts us into a mindset that oh now this is how a professional does it. It's not chaos like the beginning of the movie Jaws that we saw everybody else trying all sorts of techniques from dynamite to chumming the water, rod and reel, harpoons. This is how a pro does it. So it br- brings a whole a whole new dynamic to the movie Jaws, just him holding this rifle. Amazing to see. So that's the professionalism side that the Greener Harpoon Rifle presents to the Jaws universe. Remember, we are in the Jaws universe now. We are not in real life. How did Quint get to this professional status that you just don't fall into it? You just don't say, hey, I'm just going to go invent a rifle or, hey, I'm going to go pick up this rifle. And we also have to assume because no one else is using the rifle technique at the beginning of Jaws, because no one else uses a harpoon-mounted rifle at the beginning of Jaws, we have to assume that this is unique to Quint's world. This is a Quint original. Quint invented this technique, and that's what I wanted to uh, go into in the book of Quint. I wanted to explore what does one have to go through to actually work their way up to inventing a technique like this, the processes, the mental processes, the failures, the series of failures in trying to um, in trying to hunt sharks that make you go to this next level. Because if it was easy, then everybody would do it. If everybody, then there would be a mu- multiple guys with harpoon rifles at the beginning of Jaws, but there are none. There's only one. And how did how did he get to that level? That's what the Book of Quint explores, and that leads us into the second part, the second point of what the greener harpoon rifle brings to the Jaws universe to the character of Quint is the progression. It shows that this is what, um, it shows the progression of his hunting technique. And that's how, that's, that's what I wanted to show that other great movies and series will have that, will have a similar progression in it. The Godfather has this progression of Michael Corleone. And we have, uh, we, we have references of how Vito Corleone ran the family in First Godfather. But as you progress through that first movie of The Godfather, and then even go into The Godfather 2, we are shown how Michael, is more, Michael Corleone is more aggressive than his father in how he uh, dispatches the enemy and how he runs the family. And he does things that his father never would have done. Uh, as in even taking out family members. So it shows that progression, and that's what makes that a fascinating journey to watch as we watch that film. There's a, but there's also other series that might show a slight progression, and that makes you your mind go, how did he get to there? And that's also, you could look at Back to the Future. At the Back to the Future, the progression is, is at the end, we see Doc Brown show up with the DeLorean time machine, He no longer has, it's no longer powered by plutonium. It actually is powered by a Mr. Fusion where he's throwing trash into it and refuse, and he just throws that in there, and that's what powers the DeLorean. So there's this progression that he perfected his technique. How did he get to there? We don't know. We we aren't privy to that information, but he got, he, he grew as a character and his technique of time travel grew as well. And one more that was always fascinating was the Star Wars progression from Empire Strikes Back to the Return of the Jedi, the revelation of the green lightsaber, which shows that Luke Skywalker had achieved a higher Jedi skill. He built his own lightsaber 
and it was new and unique. It was a new color. So in, when, when you were in the theater watching Jedi and the green lightsaber lights up, everybody gasped because they never saw something like that. It was something new. And that showed the progression of the character in just the tool that he was using. So with the Book of Quint to Jaws, I wanted to show the progression of Quint's technique. The scene in the when he's building the harpoon rifle in the cabin of the orca, that moment where it's revealed where he throws this new dart on and the the dart that he thro- that he clicks onto the barrel has movable barbs, retractable barbs on it. Now I believe that that scene right there is equivalent to that progression. And I believe that that could have been a mo- that could be a moment where the audience can realize Quint never stopped working and innovating and improving his craft because he knew this moment was coming when there were another large shark was going to come around. So what the book of Quint does is that it uses it establishes his hunting technique, but what he what it's described in the book of Quint is that he uses a crude set of darts. He makes them on his own using a coal forge at the fishing shack, but he uses material that he's collected around the island to, to make these crude, a crude set of darts that can be used with this rifle. So as you read the book of Quint, you see that he's using this, this technique that he had to perfect because for various reasons, as you will see when you read the book of Quint, what is supposed to happen with a good prequel, with a solid prequel, what is supposed to happen? And it doesn't, let's say there is a film version of the book of Quint, or it's in your mind and you're reading the book of Quint. What should happen now is as you watch Jaws, when he comes out with that new, with the, with the green case, and then he comes out with the new shiny new dart with the movable barbs, with the retractable barbs on it, that would be the, wow, look, he has, look at look, something new that was invented, something, a new technique. Okay. And it's just almost the green lightsaber moment. Of, of Jaws. And that's what we can do here is by giving a backstory, you can make these moments in Jaws even more exciting than they originally were for us. They can have a whole new round of excitement. And that's what this the the Book of Quint is doing is it's showing the that the, the greener rifle is actually showing that is now the progression of Quint and his hunting technique. And remember, in, in the Jaws universe, going forward, uh, in the Jaws universe, that there, there, this is an original technique of Quint, that no one else does this because we have nobody else at the beginning with harpoon rifles. This is only Quint does this. That, and it's described exactly how Quint got to this technique, this moment. That is what's so special here is that if we look at it, just the simple revelation of this rifle by bringing it into the Jaws production by the fateful conversation between Arthur Ben David and Bob Maddy, that they presented something that now takes Quint to a, a whole new level. Because if, if Quint was throwing uh, harpoons, or if he, it, it, it would have just there, there wouldn't be this professionalism and progression aspect revealed that we have here, and that's what's so exciting about the harpoon rifle and knowing its history, knowing its history to the Jaws production, but also knowing its history inside the Jaws universe. Now that we have the Book of Quint establishing context, this subtext of just the revelation of this new harpoon that he's throwing onto the barrel brings on a a whole new meaning. It's very exciting to see. I hope everyone sees the same. Once again, thank you so much for joining us in another round of the Jaws Obsession for episode 55, Harpoon Rifle History. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired I want to go to bed. And this episode is dedicated to the memory of Arthur Walter Ben David, who passed away on June 15th, 2016, at the age of 80. Go to our show notes. I will include the obituary from the Vineyard Gazette for Arthur Ben David and his lasting effect, which was the greener harpoon rifle that was included in the production Jaws of Jaws. 
without him, this movie would have been completely different. So we dedicate this episode to him. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. The copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the fair use guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act. All rights reserved to the copyright owners. Still a chance to get a book of Quint? Go to the Crack Bean Roastery website. You can message me over at bookofquint at instagram.com. JawsOB2025 at gmail.com. We have some special episodes coming up, so we look forward to having those, having you back here in the Jaws Obsession. It's been great to have you. Thank you very much for listening. Until next week, farewell and adieu, and show me the way to go home.